Let's turn again to the book of 2 Samuel, and this time we've reached chapter 21. And we'll just read the chapter together. <clears throat> 2 Samuel and chapter one, uh, chapter 21 even, and we'll begin to read from verse 1. Then there was a famine in the days of David, three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord answered, It is for Saul and for his house of bloodshed, because he slew the Gibeonites. And the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them. And Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. Wherefore David said unto the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And wherewith shall I make the atonement that ye may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said unto him, We will have no silver nor gold of Saul, nor of his house, neither for us shall thou kill any man in Israel. And he said, What ye shall say, that will I do for you. And they answered the king, The man that consumed us, and that devised against us that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the coast of Israel, let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us, and we will hang them up unto the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord did choose. And the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. But the king took the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, whom she bare unto Saul, Armoni and Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Maholothite. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the hill before the Lord, and they fell all seven together. And were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days in the beginning of barley harvest. And Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, took sackcloth and spread it for her upon the rock from the beginning of harvest until water dropped upon the mount of heaven and suffered neither the birds of the air to rest on them by day nor the beasts of the field by night. And it was told David what Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, the concubine of Saul, had done. And David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan his son from the men of Jabesh Gilead, which had stolen them from the street of Bethshan, where the Philistines had hanged them, when the Philistines had slain Saul in Gilboa. And he brought up from thence the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan his son, and they gathered the bones of them that were hanged. And the bones of Saul and Jonathan his son buried they in the country of Benjamin in Zelah, in the sepulchre of Kish his father. And they performed all that the king commanded. And after that, God was entreated for the land. Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. And David went down, and his servants with him, and fought against the Philistines, and David waxed faint. And Ishbi, Benob, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed three hundred shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, succoured him, and smote the Philistine, and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. And it came to pass after this, that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibachai the Hushathite slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Yare Oregim, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was yet a battle in Gath, where was a man of great stature, that had on every hand six fingers, and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he also was born to the giant. And when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimea, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in Gath, and fell by the hand of David 
and by the hand of his servants. And we look to the Lord to bless to us the reading of his word this evening. Now quite clearly the passage that we've read together divides uh, neatly into two sections. The first 14 verses deal with the famine that there was in the land and the reasons for it and the solution to it. And then verses 15 to 22 has fighting with the Philistines and with the giants in particular. This particular section that we're coming into in uh, 2 Samuel from chapter 21 to the end is a section that is really almost an epilogue to the book. It's a section that, uh, that culminates in chapter 24 in the choosing of the place or in the uh, marking out of the place where the temple is going to be built, the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite. And it's working towards the beginning of 1 Kings where Solomon is going to build a temple and the Lord is going to place his name in Jerusalem and there is going to be a place built for the Lord there in Jerusalem. This particular passage that we've read this evening would, uh, would demonstrate to us that before that can happen, before the Lord can bless the people with his presence in the, form of the, uh, in the form of the temple and the glory of the Lord filling the temple, there are things that need to be sorted out. There are issues that need to be dealt with. And the two issues that we have tonight are the sins of Saul, or the sin, particular sin of Saul, and the next were the sons of the giant. It's not clear when exactly this, um, the, the events in this chapter take place. Although the chapter begins with a then, in the Hebrew it's really just an and. Uh, and so it simply says, and there was a famine in the days of David. Now this, that, that's quite general. Because this section isn't in chronological order necessarily, although it might be, but it quite likely is not in chronological order, but it's really in moral order. It is in preparation for the temple being built, and it's things that need to be sorted out. But it's uh, events that took place in the days of David. Whatever the timing, and whether the timing is chronologically towards the end of David's reign or whether it's earlier, wherever it comes in David's reign, it illustrates for us that the Lord takes sin seriously and that sin must be dealt with. If for example, if we were to assume for a minute that it is in chronological order and that this takes place towards the end of, um, at the end of David's reign, it's maybe happening some 40 years, that there's a reckoning maybe some 40 years after the events took place. But reckoning there is, for the Lord doesn't forget and the Lord doesn't overlook and the Lord doesn't say that it doesn't matter. If it has been 40 years, that would be significant, wouldn't it? So 40 in the Bible is the uh, number of the time of testing and of trial. You remember that the Israelites spent 40 years in the desert and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and the Lord Jesus was 40 days in the, uh, in the desert being tempted by the devil. 40 years, 40 years perhaps that the Lord had given to them an opportunity that the, uh, that the Lord had given to them to put this matter right, to make amends, and they hadn't done it. And now the Lord sends a famine. It was a serious sin that Saul had committed, wasn't it? You remember the, 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 the explanation of it given really in verse 2, and if you were to read the history of it, it You'd find it, and we've uh, done so in the past, haven't we, in Joshua chapter 9, where the Gibeonites, who were of the people of the land, 
that the children of Israel were supposed to conquer, they, um, by an act of deception, made a league, made a treaty with the children of Israel and with Joshua. And the people uh, under Joshua swore, made an oath by the Lord not to harm them. And Saul broke that oath. And Saul sought to exterminate the Gibeonites. He said, well, that oath had been made 500 years ago. Did it really matter? Well, the answer to that is simply, yes, it does. And the Lord expected his people to honour their promises. And he expected his people to honour the oath that they'd sworn. And that's a lesson for us, isn't it? That the Lord expects us to honour our promises. If we make promises, the Lord expects them uh, us to keep them. Not for us is the, uh, is the idea of the world that promises are made to be broken. In the Bible, promises are made to be kept. And when we think of the Lord and when we think of the promises that he made, we can rejoice in the fact that the Lord keeps his promises. We are the recipients of the promises of God. The things that we have, the things that we hope for, are based on the promises of God. And aren't we thankful that we have a God who keeps his promises? But we have a God too, who holds to account those who break their promises. And so Saul was guilty of breaking an oath. He was guilty of breaking a promise. He was guilty of shedding innocent blood. You see, these Gibeonites didn't deserve to die. They didn't deserve to be exterminated. So, you remember, had been told to wipe out the Amalekites. And he failed to do it. And now it seems that Saul is going for a soft target. And he's going for those that maybe won't fight back. And he's going for those that he, he, he can get at. It says in his zeal for Israel, the children of Israel and Judah, it's kind of nationalistic fervour. What right have these people to be in our land? And yet, by doing so, the scripture is clear that by shedding innocent blood, he was polluting the land. And the Lord took that very seriously. And it hadn't been dealt with for however long it was. We might ask the question, why? Perhaps it was that David didn't know about it. You remember that David, for much of Saul's reign, was on the run. He was being hounded. Um, he was being chased by Saul. Perhaps it was that David didn't know what had been done to the Gibeonites. That's possible. But you know, <clears throat> there's no excuse. There's no excuse. Uh, as king, surely there would be things that would come to light over time. And it was David's responsibility as king to deal with it. Or perhaps it was felt that it wasn't that serious. You see, these weren't Israelites. These were the people of the land. Yes, maybe there was some sympathy for what Saul had done. But... Um, we understand from Scripture, don't we, that God is no respecter of persons. It's an interesting thing when you go through the prophets and when you go through perhaps the book of Amos and you see the, 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 what the, the Lord thinks about how the nations treat one another. The Lord holds the nations to account, just as, it, just as much as he holds his people to account. And he holds his people to account for their treatment of the nations, just as he would hold the nations to account for their treatment of each other. You see, the Lord is no respecter of persons, and he has standards that are to be maintained. And he expects his people to keep them. As I came to this passage, and as I read through this passage initially, there are really three questions, uh, or three question marks that I really had. Over them. Now, I, I think these question marks, as I studied more, as I thought about it more, kind of disappear. But the first thing is, look in verses 2 and um, where, where it carries on in verse 3. David goes to the Gibeonites. 
And he effectively asks them, he says, what can I, what will I do for you to make an atonement for you? What will satisfy you? And as I was thinking about that, uh, and the explanation that is given in verse 2, that the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, they were of the remnant of the Amorites, I thought to myself, David, are you not doing a dangerous thing here? Are you not doing a dangerous thing in going to people who aren't of the nation of Israel, who aren't governed in the same way by the law of Israel, aren't under the, the, the covenants of the promise of Israel, aren't you kind of setting yourself up for a bit of a problem by going to them? But as we go down through the passage, I want us to see that the Gibeonites come, come out of this very, very favourably. And you wouldn't go to the world, would you, and expect a spiritual response. And you wouldn't expect a scriptural response from the world. But these were those who, who had, had been living among the people of God and were so grateful that they'd been allowed to live. That it looks like they'd immerse themselves in the scriptures. Uh, and we'll think a little bit more about the Gibeonites as we go through. The second question that I had was that there's a principle in Scripture, and you'll find it in Deuteronomy chapter 24, and verse 16. I'm going to have to keep taking these glasses off, I'm afraid. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16 says this. The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man should be put to death for his own sin. And the question mark that came over me was, then, what is right and what is just and what is fair about what happens here? Why is that principle, does that principle seem to be set aside? And I think the answer to that comes in verse 1, where the Lord answers and says it's for Saul and for his house of bloodshed or for his bloodthirsty house or his blood guilty house because he slew the Gibeonites and it may well be that those who were particularly singled out by David were those who had been complicit had been in full agreement with Saul and were therefore sharing in the guilt of Saul in what they sought to do But it is a fact, isn't it, that often the sins of the parents have consequences for the children. Perhaps it is when we think of uh, when we think of uh, the assembly that the parents have taken a particular stance that would take us away from the truth of Scripture, and it has consequences for the children as they would continue that route. Uh, and the simple lesson that we have here is just how important it is, whether as parents or whoever we are, to make sure that we maintain obedience to the Word of God and that we keep ourselves from things and from sins that would cause problems for the family or for the assembly in the future. The third question mark that I had as we thought about the, uh, as I thought about this is the Gibeonites talked about hanging them up, verse 6, unto the Lord in Gibeah of Saul. And verse 9, they hang them up in the hill before the Lord. Uh, and then you, you would see that they were put to death in the days of harvest, the beginning of the, the barley harvest. Now that was kind of March, April time. And, and Rizpah, she, um, she looked after the bodies right until the time when, when rain came from heaven, until water dropped on them out of heaven. That's verse, verse 10, that, that's six months roughly. That's around about October is when the rain comes. And there's a verse, isn't there, in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 and 23, about if you're to uh, put someone to death and they'd be hanged on a tree. You, you're not to leave them there overnight. For whoever is hanged is cursed of God. 
and effectively if I, uh, let's quote it correctly again, perhaps if I get Deuteronomy rather than Numbers, Says his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day, that thy land be not defiled. And so we have these that were left for six months. We'll come back to that, but there is an answer to that. Um, and there is a scriptural answer to this one. As we come back to the passage. We notice as far as David is concerned, as he inquires, there's a famine for three years, year after year, and you might think, well, after the first year and the crops fail, we'll see how things happen next year, and the second year crops fail, and you start thinking to yourself, maybe there's something wrong, and when it happens the third year, it's quite evident that the Lord's hand is in it, and quite evident that the Lord, for whatever reason, is withholding the crops and is causing the famine. That was a principle of scripture. There's disobedience. Uh, one of the results of disobedience would be that the Lord would withhold the rain and he'd cause the famine. And so the Lord inquires of the Lord, uh, David inquires of the Lord, and he finds out the reason for it. But you notice that David isn't just satisfied or content that the Lord has dealt with it. And the Lord has brought the famine. And he thinks, well, that's it. We've paid for it. We, we've sorted the problem out. No, David wants to sort it with the Gibeonites. And he wants to make it so that, verse 3, that ye may bless the inheritance of the Lord. You see, David realises that it's not, just enough, it's not just enough that they've suffered famine. It's not just enough that the Lord has stepped in and brought them under his discipline. He wants there to be no lasting bitterness, no lasting resentment with the Gibeonites. And that's an important, important principle, isn't it? You know, there are times when believers fall out. There are times when uh, believers are wronged. And perhaps it is that for years that there's nothing done about it, and for years there's a uh, for years there's um, not not talking, and for for years there's a, a problem that is there. And David realizes just how much problems, uh, how many problems can be caused by bitterness and resentment being allowed to fester. Uh, and now that he's been made aware of it, he wants to sort it, and that is a good. Uh, spirit. But let's come to the Gibeonites. It's interesting, isn't it? That you'd never know that Saul had sought to exterminate the Gibeonites if it weren't for this passage. You don't hear it from the Gibeonites. They've been wronged by Saul, but they're not, st they're not taking up arms and they're not standing out there with placards saying, um, uh, uh, crying out for justice, are they? They've taken it and they've kept quiet about it. Now again, that's a, a, a scriptural principle, isn't it? That if we've been wronged, that we're not out looking to get our own back, we're not out looking for vengeance, we're not out looking that, that the whole world knows that we've been wronged. It's the attitude that the Lord Jesus would say, if someone strikes you on your one cheek, offer them the other one. If someone sues you at law and takes away your coat, offer him your tunic as well. The principle that when we're wronged, we don't get in there and stand up for our own rights and want everyone to hear about it. The Gibeonites took it. Maybe it is that the Gibeonites brought it to the Lord and left it with the Lord, and the Lord in his own time dealt with it. And David comes, and David asks them, what do you want me to do for you? 
you know, I suppose there were plenty of answers that they could have given. You, need, you know, the Gibeonites, they've been brought into service. They've been made bondmen. They've been made hewers of wood, as a choppers of wood, and, and drawers of water for, for the temple of God. And that's what they've been brought into. That was, their, that was the agreement that they'd made in order for them to stay alive. Now, you know, they could have said, well... You know, that oath that was made, well, you, you broke it, you know. Well, we kept our side of the bargain, you broke it. Let, let's just have our freedom. Well, they don't ask for that. You see, these, they, these men, these people, are content to be servants in the house of God. Well, they don't want to change it. That's challenging, isn't it? Are we content to be a servant? So many people in the world around us, and sadly it can happen in assemblies as well, but so many people in the world around us, they're clamouring for prominence. And they're wanting people to wait on them and to look after them. And they're not prepared to be a servant. The Lord is looking for servants. The Lord Jesus, when he came, the greatest of all is the one who became a servant. And those who follow him should take on his servant character. These Gibeonites, they'd learn something, you know. They'd learn something about the value of being servants. But hey, then they'd learn something else. David says, well, what, what do you want? What can I give you? What reparation? What um, com commiseration? What, what compensation? Let's get the right word. What compensation can I give you? He says, well, we don't want silver or gold. We don't want your money. We don't want it from you. We don't want it from Saul's house. We don't want money. That's not what we're after. Mind you, that's different, isn't it? That's different from what the world around, uh, what the world around us is. In the kind of culture that we've got around at the minute, we trip over a curbstone and we're looking to sue the council. And we're looking for what compensation we can get. And we're looking for what money we can get. These people are saying, I don't want money. It's not what we want. We're not in it for the money. Neither should we be. Our character as believers shouldn't be those that are seeking to sue others and seeking to get whatever we can from those that we feel owe us. There's something else they said. They said, neither for us shalt thou kill any man in Israel. He said, well, but I thought they, they were asking for seven of Saul's sons. Yes, they are. But listen to what they're saying. We don't want you to do it. We don't want you to have their blood on your hands. We don't want you to be involved. And I wonder whether the Gibeonites were not entirely sure whether what they were asking for was right. But they didn't want David to have his name associated with what they were doing. Now that's interesting. If this took, uh, took place earlier in David's reign, it might give some context to what Shimei was saying. You remember Shimei was the man that cursed David as he, uh, as he went and was talking about the man of bloodshed and talking about the Lord's brought onto you all the bloodshed of the household of Saul that's been shed. And the seven of the house of Saul are the, uh, whose blood is shed here. For the Gibeonites are keen that it's not David's responsibility. You notice, Saul had sought to exterminate them all. But they don't ask for the extermination of Saul's family. You know the Bible says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. It's not our place to seek vengeance, is not our place to respond in kind. Now 
that's the point, isn't that? Very often, isn't it? We're, we're provoked and we respond. Whatever it is, someone speaks harsh words to us and we speak back in exactly the same way. It's not ours to respond in kind. But as the Lord Jesus did, it's ours to commit it to the Lord. And so they don't ask for the extermination of Saul's household, but they just ask for seven men. And they'd learned something about the number seven, hadn't they? They'd learned that seven was a special kind of number in Scripture. It was the perfect number. And they were looking to, and they were looking to, uh, to, to bring the, the judgment of God away from the nation. That's what they wanted. And so they stuck at seven. And they said that we want them to be delivered to us, and we will. And they wanted the responsibility for it. And they said, we will hang them up unto the Lord in Gibeah of Saul. Now, it's not exactly clear what that means. It's almost certainly not hanging. It's, it's, um, it's quite an obscure meaning. Interestingly, the word only appears one other place in Scripture. And it appears in Numbers chapter 25. Now in Numbers chapter 25, it's after Balaam has been, uh, been called and, and after that the Moabites come and there's some gross immorality that has taken place between Israel and the Moabites. And there's a plague that has started among the people. And the way that the plague is to be stopped is that those who have engaged in this practice that they were to be Hung up is this word. Or maybe it is that they were to be killed and their bodies were to be exposed before the Lord. They were to be left out into the elements. They were to be made a public example of, whatever uh, it means. But it was unto the Lord. And it was for the eye of the Lord that the Lord might look down and that in Numbers 25 the plague might be, so it might be stopped. And for the Gibeonites, that the famine here might be stopped. They were looking for the good of the whole of the people. Isn't that gracious of them? Saul had sought that, um, that they should be exterminated. And you could have thought that they'd sit there with their arms folded and you said, well, Israel has it coming to them and they deserve all they get. But they don't do that. What they come up with is a... Uh, an answer, a solution that is based on scripture. It's a scriptural answer to the question with the designs that the Lord would look favourably upon the nation. Isn't that gracious? But let's not miss the lesson. When we sin, it doesn't just bring consequences for us. It brings consequences for others. And it can bring consequences for future generations. You notice that David is careful in his choice of the seven that he grants. He's the, the two sons of Aya, who is the concubine of Saul. And that was a, a, an unscriptural relationship. And the five sons of Michael, or the five sons really of Mirab, the daughter of Saul, because she was the one who was married to Adriel, the son of Basileia, the Mahalathite. You remember in 1 Samuel 18, and we'll remember it easily because Leonard dealt with it the other week, but you remember in 1 Samuel 18, maybe it was fortuitous that uh, Leonard took us back then, but you remember there that when that, that Saul had promised that the one who uh, slew Goliath would be given his daughter, Mirab as wife and then he didn't keep his promise and Mirab should have been David's wife and then Michael who was David's wife had been taken away from him as well and had been given to somebody else uh, and so there's all kinds of complicated things but notice this in verse 7 it says the king spared Mephibosheth the son of Jonathan the son of Saul because of the Lord's oath it was between them. And Saul and Jonathan had sworn that oath 
of friendship and of loyalty to one another and of loyalty to each other's families down through the generations. And though Saul might break an oath that the people had made years ago, David isn't going to do the same. And so we see the, something of the character of David. But we see something of the care and the dignity that Rizpah shows for the dead. You know, it was a really shameful thing for them not to be buried. It was a really shameful thing for them to be exposed to the elements exposed to, the, uh, to, to being eaten by beasts or to be being eaten by the vultures. And Rispa, she's there, and day and night she guards the bodies. And day and night she keeps their dignity. And again, that's something that we need to bear in mind. Particularly in an assembly context, that there, if there are those that come under the discipline of the Lord... If there are some, perhaps, that have to come under the discipline of the, of the assembly. We don't treat them as those that are without dignity. We don't treat them as something to be cast out and, uh, 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 and discarded. You see, for those that come under the discipline of the assembly, the, the desire is, and the aim and the motivation should be that they be brought back. And she looked after them day and night for six months until the rain came, until the Lord had answered the, uh, and ended the famine. And so, so, so David too comes and he takes the, um, the, the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan and the, uh, the bodies of those that, have, um, uh, the, the, those that have died here and he buries them in the sepulchre of Kish. And after that, it says, God was entreated for the land. Sin had been dealt with. This particular sin, at any rate, had been dealt with. But now, just for a few minutes, I don't even know what time I started tonight, but just for a few minutes, um, we'll think about these last verses. Because if sin needs to be dealt with, so do the sons of the giant. Uh, and you'll notice that they, they were the sons of the giant. There was a singular giant and you ask, who was this giant? Well, I think it was Goliath. I think Goliath was the giant in those days, wasn't he? He was the one that David had killed. But see this. And here's something to remember as well, that the servants of the Lord are only men. And David, in his younger day, had been able to go and stand out against the giant whose spear well, 600, uh, weighed 600 shekels. And here's a man, the weight of whose spear was 300 shekels, half as much. Not as formidable a giant. And yet David's struggling. David struggles to overcome him. He faints, and he nearly dies in the process. We need to be aware, as the people of God, and those of us that get older, of the limitations of the body and the limitations of the flesh. Can't hang on to things forever. Things need to be passed on to a, a new generation that's coming up, and it's important that the new generation takes their place and takes their stand and fights their battles. But you see... For every generation, there are giants to face. And, and whereas David went and he fought one giant, here there are four giants. And the battle never goes away. But here's the difference. David was very much alone when he went down into the, down into the valley to face Goliath, wasn't he? There was no one else went with him. The rest, of the, uh, the rest of the army was shaking in their boots. Saul was shaking. Jonathan was shaking. There was no one going with him. He went down alone to face the giant. And because he did, there are others that are encouraged and strengthened to go and do the same after him. There are others that went and fought their own giants. Abishai and Sibachai 
and Elhanan and Jonathan and they go out and they fight their own giants and they win their own battles. May the Lord encourage us to follow the example of those who have laboured and have fought bravely in the past for the Lord and to follow their example. It's interesting, just as we come to the close of the passage, verse 21, there's this um, man that's got six fingers on every hand and six toes on each foot, every hand, each hand, and six toes on each foot. When he defied Israel, verse 21, Jonathan, the son of Shimea, the brother of David, slew him. Now we've come across another son of Shimea as we've been uh, uh, working through, and he was an altogether different character wasn't he? Remember Jonadab. Sounds similar, different man. Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother, he was the one who was Amnon's friend, in inverted commas, and who encouraged Amnon to do what was wrong. Encouraged Amnon to go down in disastrous paths and showed absolutely no care for him when that had happened. Ah, but Jonathan, his brother, completely different. Now, we see that, don't we? We're not bound by what our siblings do. We're not bound by what our parents do. We're not, uh, we're, we're not, we are our own people. It's our responsibility to stand up ourselves and we can stand up and be counted. And we can be a force for good among the people of God or we can be a force for evil. And the choice is ours. With the Lord's help, of course. But the choice is ours what path we want to follow. Just one more thing before we finish. You'll notice in verse 19, it talks about where he slew the brother of Goliath, and if you're attentive, you'll see that the, the brother of is in italics. And it simply says he slew Goliath the Gittite. Now, there are people who have um, got a real tiz over this over the years. And so how can he slay Goliath when David slew Goliath years ago? Well, the simple answer to that uh, that, that I would bring is, have you never heard of a son being called by the same name as his father? You only have to go to St. Monans and you'll find a robber and a Bert and a, uh, and a Rob and a Bobby uh, in succeeding generations. And it's quite possible, is it not, that this Goliath was the son of the other Goliath. Certainly he wasn't the same man. Maybe it was his brother. Then there's, uh, if you read between this passage and Chronicles, it's possible that he was the brother. But I think these, all these four were born to the giant in Gath. These were all Goliath's sons. And they were still causing problems for the people of God. And they needed to be dealt with. And wherever the enemy rises. It's 1 John chapter 2, isn't it, that talks about the young men. And it says, because you're strong and you've overcome the wicked one. The wicked one is always there and we need to overcome. May the Lord bless his way. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank thee for this time we've had together this evening. We thank thee, Father, for the passage that we've looked at. We thank thee, Father, for the Gibeonites. And we thank you, Father, for the lessons, the beautiful lessons that they can bring to us of, uh, of behaviour that should mark us, and attitudes that should mark us. And our Father, we do look to thee that thou bless thy word to us tonight and give us an understanding. We're conscious, our Father, that at uh, first glance, as we look at the passage that we've looked at tonight, we wonder uh, what we can learn. But our Father, we do pray that we might have been instructed and helped as we've looked into thy word this evening. So bless us and help us. And watch over us as we uh, go home, we ask thee. We give thee thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.